keep in mind thinking about uh, things to look out for and uh, help from that. Uh, and then we'll go into content. <laughs> oh, and since the office New Year's, in fact, we got some important new things there, and there are a few traditions that might be unfamiliar. So let's get started. My Chris, do some photos. You can all them, but they are from the first time. Senior Logan is my friend, so let's say with uh, Sadie and Cody. Very good to know. I remember Sadie. Yeah, and then. This is probably the highest point that we're going to uh, Miyajima, uh, Hiroshima, and seeing this story date in the water. I lived in Hiroshima for two years. I've been to this island <laughs> so many times, and I have never seen it in person. It was under construction or under renovation the entire time. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't like a subtle renovation, they just fully tarped over the whole thing. It was just like a gray box in the middle of the water. So, my oh. first time seeing any of it at all. Uh, I'll talk about this later, but you can see the crowds are there again. I experienced Japan with no crowds, so that was a big difference for me this time, is actually seeing it kind of how, how it usually is, not how it was during COVID or anything like that. Although uh, I think the like Christmas crowds were a little lower than usual, but then New Year's and New Year went back up. So it's kind of it's there. The gun Full scale. Really <laughs> uh, this one is in Miyajima in Hiroshima. I think that's it's one of our stops really on our trip, yeah. so it's further, it's in the south of Tokyo. Yeah, I think this one it should be on the actual. Well, she's not going on the trip oh. with us, she's going to visit her husband, her, her son in, in March. Okay, so she's going separately from us. Mm -hmm. So Going from Tokyo, you mean with the bases? Yeah, we're trying to plan a few days. Would mm -hmm. she be able to make it on the boat on the bullet train mm -hmm. and back? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it would just be a long day. Like it might cut it short. I really recommend staying the night there. Mm -hmm. Once we pull that one off for the weekend, mm -hmm. um, it's really nice because as soon as it hits maybe six thirty, there's nobody on the island anymore. Mm -hmm. All the clothes, all the like shops kind of start closing. It's two new ones, so all the crowds leave. Um, it's just you and the deer. And the shrine, so it's really nice. Um, this is about a four hour bullet train from Tokyo to Hiroshima, and then another 30 minute train to here, and then like a 15 minute carry or something. But yeah, kind of, kind of setting close for Yeah, you need a, a you need a full day for that. Yeah, I yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, I really recommend spending the night there. And, uh, and then this uh, first one here is the and the Gundam. This isn't even the coolest kind of Japan. This one is in Tokyo, uh, in Odaiba, like on an island in Tokyo Bay. Uh, I didn't get a chance to go to a much cooler one in Yokohama. This one has a light show where it's kind of it's a unicorn horn, so it opens up like still in the battle mode uh, that doesn't really move. The one in Yokohama like starts kneeling, stands up, oh, struggles cool. all the movement. That one is uh, intense. And that, that one you could do a day trip from Tokyo. Mm -hmm. Are there multiple Gundams in Japan or is like I think that's just those two. Yes, those two. But I would believe that it's something they're working on there. Okay. <laughs> it's a really big uh, brand in mm -hmm. Japan. Like you see it kind of a lot of places. Uh, it's been around for a long time. Yeah. So I would definitely imagine they're trying to make more. It's anime from the 80s. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's also, I know that. New stuff like now, like even new stuff is consistently good. So yeah. Okay. That's really impressive. Let's see. So that's not how was it? Um, so it was my first time going to Japan as a tourist, and also as a tour guide, because I was just leading my friends around. Uh, I, I felt like I had children. So <laughs> that was a new experience for me. When you go in the summer, you will have children. Yes, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, no, I, I think they'll be more well behaved than that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, the first time going to the tourists, and I feel like that was definitely a uh, big difference between uh, living there. I had my home base. I like, if I needed more money, I had a bank account there. It was all very easy. Um, and this time, it was just a little more like, felt like running gun. Like, I was just winging it all the time, uh, even though I had a third in the class. Um, but still a lot of fun. It's hard to say which one I was really more like going on trips while I was living or going on this trip. Uh, but a lot of fun. And the only thing I would say is, uh, so it followed a similar route to what the, the kind of group trip is. I went from Tokyo to Hakone uh, just for like a few hours down to Kyoto, then Osaka, uh, Kobe, and then Hiroshima. So I have like, I don't think we just stopped to Kobe, uh, but then I didn't go to Nara, so it's kind of like a yeah. slightly different itinerary. Uh, but the difference is this one was two weeks, so it was just a senior as opposed like to uh, 11 days. So a really long trip. Uh, I think the only thing I would change is I would go to less places. I felt like that was a lot and I was busy the whole time. Like, and you were there for 14 days. Yeah, I think we been 16 or something. It was a lot. Uh, so we're fitting in a lot in, in our internet. I think the itinerary is actually better. Somehow, just the way that it's split up. Okay. Uh, and plus, the transportation is all kind of taken care of. Yeah. The real stress is when, like, you have a day to travel, and I'm just kind of being on the fly, and so right. everything's set up. So I think it's going to be fine. Okay. But it just it feels so tense when, like, you have to set up your own hotel and your own things like that. Okay. So, yeah. So that's less stress for us. I think so. Yeah. Okay. That's that's <laughs> the real stress came from those days, like moving between cities. Uh, but that's all. Arranged, right? So that could be fine. Uh, and it's really not that bad. I think because it was uh, Christmas, this kind of quiet time because they don't celebrate Christmas, like nobody gets a day off for Christmas. New Year's, everybody has a day off. So after New Year's for like that week, insanity. I wouldn't recommend doing that. It's very busy. Um, and that's probably why it felt like every time we got to my friend, we might just have to stand for a few stop minutes to get off. Uh, at one point, I can't because the guy, uh, like the conductor or something, came down the train looking, like checking off tickets. And I thought, well, I, like, I know my tickets fine. We didn't like jump on the train and go leave there. Okay? But I've never seen them checking tickets before. So I started getting worried. And then I looked at the, the door, kind of opened to another car, and it was just full of people standing. And I was thinking, is it off the train? Did they not have a seat? Like, does it get too full? Uh, in the end, I didn't find out any answers. I just checked my ticket. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the train, so I didn't, I knew about this, but I've never seen it. The Shinkansen can get full uh, and you'll just have standing seats. Uh, the way to avoid that is to get reserved seats, which cost like a thousand yen more. And I think the, if you're taking the Shinkansen, the company should probably do that. That seems like the, their basic right. thing. Like, they have to so there. you haven't seen the Shinkansen where like, they actually have the, the pushers to push you into uh, the train. I don't think it was push or pull, but it was like people down the entire aisle. It felt like I was in a bus, like a really big right. city bus. Because I've seen videos yeah. where they have pushers push people onto the train because it's so full. It, it was it was getting there. So okay. that's surprising. New Year's a much higher time for locals, like domestic tourists. A lot of people don't go in there for New Year's because like a thing you want to do like around your family and your own country but uh domestically people travel all over the place uh so that was a good thing uh christmas in tokyo i think we, we got there on the 24th so right christmas in tokyo was interesting because i saw decorations everywhere and it was like a christmas market and so sometimes uh, people dressed up like elves or like Santa, and I thought, oh, okay, it's kind of uh, it's Christmassy. But then everybody was like still working, like it was still the same case with Tokyo every other day, so it just felt like a weirdness. But um, there was some nice moments. Um, 
like this is Tokyo Tower lit up like a Christmas tree. So, you know, I think I said before that Japan doesn't really celebrate Christmas, and I said to my friends over there, and they saw this, and they're like, you're lying. There's no way that they don't <laughs> celebrate Christmas when they do something like this. And I thought, yeah, I mean, they celebrate it in a really different way. I'll put it like that. So it still felt like Christmas, just really different. Um, oh, and I want to talk about a little bit shortly that Japan had a few like disasters in the beginning of the year, but uh, didn't affect us at all, which is was fine, thankfully. Uh, I know people were concerned. <laughs> So uh, everything went fine. I believe on January 1st, there was a really strong earthquake. Uh, I wasn't that geographically far from where it was, but I think I had just crossed over like a body of water onto an island. So it didn't transfer us. And that was like over a pretty big deal. Uh, and then the plane at the airport. Yeah, and then the plane, there was a plane crash at Haneda, which is the same airport I took off from like five days after that. Mm -hmm. I believe for maybe three days there were like severe delays, and then everything was fine. So they fixed it within three days? Yeah, I think so. They just, like, I think they had closed things off. And then, the, that, uh, not in Japan, the Alaskan Airlines flight that got the cyber off, mm -hmm. that did cause a lot of delays into the ground at all those planes. Right. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. yeah, different, different things there. But so, question back, back, yeah. How long was your flight? Were your flights, your um, travel days? Let's see. The, First day, we got a really roundabout ticket that we had to go drive to Charlotte and then go fly to DC. That was one hour. And then a waste of time. And the next flight was direct from DC to Haneda, and it was 14 hours. You had a direct flight from Haneda, from DC? Yeah, from DC. So it wasn't that bad. 14 hours uh, is really bad for seven hours, and then time flies after that. Okay. Yeah. It's like you really have to split into the two halves. Um, I recommend. Sleeping the first seven hours or somewhere in between there. Um, I think I've had longer ones direct from DC. Something must have been something. Like I think the first one I went I took about 17 hours. Okay. Uh, that is unbearably long, and I recommend doing everything you can to like avoid cramps, avoid your like falling asleep, like get up and walk around, take plenty of bathroom breaks, like drink lots of water. Drink lots of water. Yeah. Food is actually really good. The service there that like you get three meals over the flight. They're all really good. Uh it means less than time, I would say. Okay. Uh, cleaning your own headphones on the plane if you want to like plug and watch movies. The ones they give you are like it's like a tin can. Uh, I had one and about four hours into the return flight, uh it one of them stopped working. So I was just suffering what happened to people. It's the cheap SOL. <laughs> yeah, 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 that you get. Yeah, government issued headphones yeah. or something. Uh, yeah, I definitely recommend anything is better than those, like even just for like a, a $5 pair of headphones. Yeah, that's right. totally yeah. Um, that was a direct 14 hour flight. The <laughs> flight back uh, was nine hours to San Francisco. And then because of the plane grounding, we had a whole thing, and it was like another 12 hours to get back to. So if we can get a direct flight from somewhere, like if we could get to DC with a direct flight, we'll be fine. Yes, I think I'm so. not not to expect anything more than twenty hours. No, I don't think so. And then Carl was saying that it's a flight from Japan to Japan. Yeah, I would think Chicago is usually better, although some places because of they like to go over the north. Chicago should be better for that, but I'm just thinking there's some other cities like if you go to Houston, you might end up being like, oh, it's further west, it'll be closer, but you have to go so far and more to get there. Right. Um, so yeah, I think Chicago is pretty good. Howard. We don't find out our flight information until spring. Yeah. Um, it is interesting just to go over like Alaska and getting really close to Russia. I looked out the window and there was just no clouds even at 30,000 feet. Like it just see down below and it was just a straight sheet of ice. It's all of Alaska and the like, I couldn't believe it. I didn't know. <laughs> yeah, I just said never yeah. uh, I wasn't super good at it this time. On the way there, 
this time. On the way back, I crumpled me. This was a really long day of travel with like multiple flight changes and delays and everything. If you don't get that, you should be fine. And that's a flight change time change. Yeah. I bet I had that, like yeah, 12, that was, 15 hours. It was like, I got like a double edge jet lag. One, because it was an extremely long day where I was up for basically like 36 hours in a row. So that set me back. And then when I woke up, the time change was bad. So try to get the day off after the day after we're supposed to come back off. I could feel it work easier the next day. Yeah. <laughs> I was I could work from home. So it was just a very like zombie day. It's hard to determine which direction mm -hmm. works. And I think it just depends on the person. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, for me, it's coming back to work. Going from the east mm -hmm. towards Europe, that's how it's hard. But then coming back from Europe, east to west, you know, we're flying from the United States. that drinking lots of water does kind of help with the jet lag. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's just, just being in the plane so long, you have to cycle there. Yeah. It's the same position, your whole body starts to lock up. Uh, yeah, just like, getting up and taking your walk, kind of your feet on the plane while you can, and then drinking a lot of water. It takes a full lot of body. Getting in that walking for too long. I'm pretty sure there were some other incidents. Too many accounts, I can But um, luckily, it didn't, it didn't seem to affect me. I think uh, one thing I will say is with maybe not so much the earthquake, but with the same fact is that the people in Japan are, from a very young age, taught what to do in emergencies and like practice it fairly often. I know that, you know, people like a fire drill or tornado drill, um, stuff like that. But it feels like uh, in Japan, they kind of take it a little more seriously. I know that the, the plane 
plane that got hit, no, the plane that hit and caught on fire, uh, everybody evacuated fine within like three minutes, mm. uh, even though it was on fire on the runway. So uh, seeing that, that was kind of like early on a story of praise. They were saying like, we're really good for, um, for all these like, people on the plane to follow the instructions very well to get off kind of thing. I will say, uh, I wasn't too worried about getting onto a plane after that happening, just because I know that uh, flying is still like the safest form of travel, even though there was that accident like three days before I got on the plane. I wasn't really worried. So, uh, yeah, I think I just have faith in Japan that everything will work out, even if something bad happens. Um, I just have seen it throughout my time living there and then in the news. They, they work it out. So, yeah, a lot of not great things happen to the news here, but it's something on. That's kind of Japan's motto. Uh, it's called Dama, D A M A N, is just the like the don't give up here. It's just kind of like it keep coming. And then, if I had to guess, that will probably be the kanji of the year for 2024. Uh, yeah, they always announce them at the year. The kanji of 2023 was taxes. Taxes? <laughs> yeah, they decided that was the word to represent the entire year. So hopefully, 2024 is something a little more inspired. <laughs> uh, so, that's more pictures. Uh, like I said last time, this is a Christmas version of Japan. It's the uh, eternal, eternal pause, or whatever you want to call it. So, we've got uh, uh, they're kind of special boxes that you have to order ahead of time. Um, even though it just looks like a chicken, I don't think there's anything like spectacular about it. But you have to order ahead of time for the Christmas box. And then you check out the Santa Sandbox standards as a uh, kind of out there. So that's fun. And this is a Christmas cake I saw. I thought about buying it, but it was for four to six people. And we just thought that. There's no way to like, I don't want to leave it in the hotel just sitting there, so I didn't have a plan for it. But Christmas cake, you can see just a white cake with strawberries. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, another good note the exchange rate in Japan is still really, really good. So everything there is extremely cheap. Uh, you want to go a long way there. Uh, food, especially, is really affordable in Japan. Uh, I've heard, like, even before that kind of current lower. Uh, Plus so that's like price. three bucks, isn't it? That cake? Uh, 32, it would be maybe oh. 25, or less than 22 dollars, or something like that. Okay. Yeah. Can you suggest um, using the app? Like, can you see a credit card? Does it matter? Uh, yeah, I think I have that on a later screen. Uh, <laughs> I think maybe I'll talk about that later. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good question. Um, I, I kind of regret. Part of me is like I should have gotten the KFC and the Christmas cake just to have like the whole Japan Christmas thing. But like when you're surrounded by so much different food, I just didn't. No part of me wanted to eat KFC that day. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing about it kind of appetizing. Uh, Christmas cake though, maybe that's a good one. Uh, one thing I saw a lot of is Godzilla. They, they love Godzilla. Uh, how many times this was? Countries that love Godzilla. Uh, and all the different variations of him. I think this is one from like the 1960s movie, and this is one from the 2016 one. I think that's Jim Godzilla. So, uh, if you're a fan of that, I'd say there's a lot of places around Tokyo where you can just get a, get a glimpse of Godzilla. Uh, some of them are like full scale. This one was flipping over a hotel and a movie theater, so this is really big. Um, that one is a statue in the only way. Really small for that. Um, saw some kind of like winter art. This is also on the side, but they had music playing and like a disco ball in the middle. Nice. So I still got to feel like there were a few moments going around on Christmas that felt like, okay, this is like like a Christmas art. See the lights, see the illumination, see the dress up. Uh, so that was nice. And I'm expecting it. I have no idea. It's going to be just like near a parking lot, near a mall.
mall that we happened to go to with the secret dungeon. So that was a nice surprise. Um, I would say uh, Tokyo, especially, but kind of all Japan is full of surprises like that, where it's not what you expected. I guess that's the thing with traveling, right? It's not your end goal or your destination, but something really cool along the way to look out for. Um, so it was nice to uh, kind of not have a super strict itinerary on this trip, where we had like you know, 30 minutes to get there to enjoy it. Uh, and the Statue of Liberty, which they have in Tokyo as well, uh, not the full size, but overlooking Tokyo Bay, also on a dive if you get on trip and you want to see a bit of America, that's what I recommend. Yeah. Yeah, everything was open basically 24 7, like we even used to it. And that's really important when like restaurants start closing at like 8 30. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot, a lot of things open close earlier in Japan. Surprising for Tokyo, but it's really bad when you get further out. Like on the Ajima, for example, the the lady running the hotel told us that everything will close at seven. Absolutely everything. So eat before or buy some food and bring it. But yeah, just the way you will just go hungry that night. There's nothing open. Uh, Even the hotel restaurant? Uh yeah, well, I think there was one hotel. That stayed open until like nine or ten. Okay. And that's actually what ended up eating anyway. So yeah, you, you have to like, well, it just cuts down your selection a lot more. And that place wasn't like a traditional Japanese thing. It was just like a hotel bar that took uh, okay. prices. So that was really bad. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Have you ever been to like uh, what do you mean by that? It's like restaurants that like American food. Western food. Yes, I have. Uh, I they're actually really good. I went to oh, I should have put a picture on it. I went to a New York pizza restaurant in uh, Tokyo. I think really good. Like just a giant pepperoni pizza, juicy, juicy as you like. Um, and they're really good because the people who run those restaurants usually speak English. You can like have a nice conversation, learn about their story, what made them decide to open something like that. Um, you do see them from time to time. And I would say the quality is usually pretty good uh, because it's people that are like really passionate about that one specific food, like a burger or a burrito or something like that. And they're like, I'm going to make this my whole personality to make like tacos when we can. <laughs> um, so they, they really like it. It's a uh, dedication and they're good. Yeah. I think that's good. Oh, I've got some more pictures. Little side by side of uh, the sky tree, which it was my first time going up there. Absolutely recommend it. It's really nice. The line can be a bit long, but you can get them online, skip the line. Um, it costs maybe one dollar to go over the top. Which not bad. It's not bad for like towers. Yeah, because the Eiffel Tower is more expensive than that. Yeah. I think Kobe Tower, which is not near as impressive as this, uh, is probably like forty dollars. Yeah. Luckily, it's closed, but I didn't pay for that. Uh, really great view. Uh, another one I recommend for you this is a little sunset shot of Fuji, and it's about the best shot of Fuji I got the entire trip. Uh, didn't get lucky with the Shinkansen seats on the way up or down. Uh, if you want to be on like a certain side down, you want to be on the right, and up, you want to be on the left, you can not Fuji. And then you can also get the right angle. But you can still see really close to the city, really big. Uh, this is from the uh, Shinjuku Tokyo Metropolitan Government Building. It's a really interesting building uh, architecturally, and this is also from there. So it's a really nice 360 feet view of Tokyo from Shinjuku side to way over here. In terms of this picture, it would be like important. Uh, mostly, you can see kind of all of Tokyo, which is impressive because it is massive and it goes on to city as far as that. Uh, but really impressive. This is just a random example, I think, that I saw. It wasn't on the itinerary, wasn't anything, but it just happened to be near our hotel. So we spent you know, a few minutes looking. 
from around there. And that, that's kind of part of the fun is even in a city like Tokyo, so massive, so like that you can see the city everywhere. You can turn around the corner and just see a random Eastern temple and stop off that. So that's really nice. And then oh, over here, I just, I, I kind of, I like train blocks, so like peeked out over this uh, intersection where it's the river. And then I think four different train tracks, but you can't see all of them perfectly, but this is this one and those both ways. This is a train station, so they come up here, that way, up this way. Just a really, a little cheeky <laughs> train spot. Um, near Akihabara, if you also like train. I think like just walking down that river, you can see those buildings at the end. That is not too high, but here that was really nice. And this is also a shot from the Tokyo Metropolitan Government Building at night. That's the sun went down. Uh, it's, uh, it's a whole different vibe in the city. Sometimes you have to like sit down, wait a while for the scenery change and get a hold of the book. Uh, and see. Everything looks different at night. Yeah, yeah, it's really nice. To see. One, to be up there with the sun setting, and then two, seeing kind of all the lights that start to flicker on, and it's a really nice vibe. Uh, and, and, for the sky tree, I would say, like, it's probably easiest to get it online. You know, get like a QR code and just walk up, get the line, tap in. Um, you can just walk up and have to wait in line to get your ticket. And sometimes it can be busy. I think it was probably extra busy when I went because there was a Christmas market at the base of the tower. So it's like a little bit of Luckily, this one is free. You can just go up there. So I, that's, that's just, I love this building. So that it's free, it has a great view. Uh, it's in Shinjuku, so this is like the Shinjuku area. Really nice. Um, Nicole on, on Zoom says she loves the photo with the train. <laughs> that's validation. <laughs> I was worried that my friends wouldn't like it, but once we saw, they were like, what, what comes we're here to watch a train. As soon as like three trains at the same time went, they were like, hold on, let me take a picture. Like, <laughs> when's the next train? So, but I was like, really I've really actually cool. seen a similar shot. Mm -hmm. I think I went to like that the spot. I yeah. Get the right angle, but I, I've seen a similar shot of of, of that train mm -hmm. that train view that you took. And yeah. I was like, that looks like something off the internet. Really like that spot. So, yeah, that was a good one. I think it's good. Like if you follow things on uh, uh, on social media that show you like little spots of Tokyo, I think it's nice to kind of save those for when you know if you have a little bit of free time, you might just somehow end up being really close to it. Mm -hmm. You're like, oh, that's perfect. Let's go see the spot. Like, didn't expect to see it. Wasn't part of the itinerary, but I heard of it. It's close. Yeah. There's okay. one that I found that I watched some videos where people just walk where they have the oh, itinerary yeah. and everything, and just walking down the street. Mm -hmm. And there is a temple right off Sakaguchi Street in Hajuku. Yeah. You turn it like the first busy street shop mm -hmm. to the left, and it's literally like one block. You know, like Sojo Temple. Yeah. And then there's a garden you can scroll through and then you can go back to the park. And I was like, I want to go there. I think I can remember turn at the first place. Yeah. I'll tell you, it's right next to the public bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> it's so pretty, though. Yeah, it's next to like a, like a kindergarten and like the public bathroom over there. Uh, Takajita Street in Hajuku is an interesting place. It's probably the most crowded place I saw in all of Japan. The entire time. Uh, it's <laughs> yeah, it's like a really narrow street where kind of all the the busyness is. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's so weird. You walk over the Juku and it's like an empty street with just like a few hair salons. Mm -hmm. And then you turn a corner and then suddenly there's like a thousand people in like a 10 meter long street. So it's mm -hmm. really surprising. Um, but it's good space. <laughs> I, I recommend this little space that's really close to um, the Yogi Park. The Yogi Park is which the which the main view is fine. So it's probably somewhere you'll already go, so if you have the time, just go. Yeah, we're going to make you try. Yeah. Uh, maybe just taking a look down the street is good. Honestly, I saw more people 
piled up at the end of the street taking pictures than I did like on the street itself. So okay. yeah, but even both were extremely crowded. Um, it's actually really close to where the street is. Just uh, just out of view is at night the entire it's a black sea that is zero be parked because it's a park and there's no street like they close it at mm -hmm. a certain time like at sunset. So uh, like as, as impressive as this view is, you turn a little to the right and then there's just pitch black in the middle of the city. That looks like a stadium. Yeah, is that I think the Olympic one okay. that they built. One of them? Yeah, this was like their flagship one that's supposed to be really great. I think it is a good stadium, uh, but the, the Olympic it's just rained on that break and like the shows and everything. Yeah, that was a bummer. Um, yeah, that was a bummer. Yeah, oh, I was going to say, just in terms of like getting really nice views like that, there's a, not a ton of places that you can go because a lot of these, like the Eagle College, is just office building. Even this one is a government office building that just happens to have an observatory. Um, but in cities, you, there are usually, well, it's not usually, kind of usually, a tower. That they just like to have as like the landmark for the city. So I know like Osaka has one, Kobe has one, Tokyo has two, uh, but Hiroshima doesn't, for example. So if there's a tower, you'll probably be able to go inside and get a nice view of the city. Uh, so like oh, this is another tall building, you can't go up in one. So there's just a few spots like that uh, that you could look up online, like best view in Tokyo. I think if you look it up, the best view in Tokyo, it'll Take you to a building close to here where you can, I think they call it the best because you're not on the tallest building, but you're next to it. So you can see like this building and the one that's kind of just in front and like Tokyo Tower. So it's kind of like you get to see the But the real best one is this is right. Yeah, this is Which is kind of the high rise, the skyscraper part of Tokyo. Um, that would be a flat cell. I think you picture it a little better. Um, it kind of flattens out after it's in the Ginza area. It's less interesting building. Um, and you can see that you kind of stand below. There's no tall thing next to it. So that's what, well, no, that's what it is. But yeah, there's literally not the tall perspective that they want to see. What I learned, uh, just to touch on this, uh, tax-free shopping is really useful. The amount, uh, basically that is, if you have your passport with you at a shop, you can show it to them, so just like running to make sure that you are on a visitor visa and not like living in Japan, they can just go into stamp that they give you at the airport. Um, and depending on the amount, different stores have different amounts, but once you meet that threshold, they will take off the taxes and get some savings there. So I really recommend keeping your passport with you. Obviously, you should always have a passport with you. But with the added bonus of saving money, there's even more reason to have it with you. But just for sure, residents can't use it. Uh, I guess like that, if you're with your son, he can use it. Mm -hmm. so. Take advantage of that. Maybe you don't need anything new, you can buy it. <laughs> That's really nice. And uh, talk on credit cards. I will say that credit cards are a lot more prevalent than uh, than I had previously experienced, especially in the touristy areas. You can see a tiny shop with just like a one little way you're running it. it pulls out like the square meter of the credit card. So, <laughs> they've got it covered uh, there mostly. I actually experienced some places where it was kind of cash only. I would recommend sharing that, um, but you can get by without it. I think both of my friends at one point, they were like, oh, Michael, we're running out of cash. But it was only because they were trying to spend it. They could have been using their credit cards the whole time. Right. Because uh, <laughs> I've overprepared for a lot of money. Like here, I'll then know you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's not that to the tally. Um, but yeah, credit cards are pretty good. Just make sure you don't have any. Um, international transaction fees. Uh, if you do, they might not be that much. Like I think in when I went to England, I accidentally used my credit card, and it did charge me like two cents per transaction, which did add up because I was using it to tap onto the train. So it was just like 
eventually becoming a noticeable amount. Um, not really, but a few dollars. Uh, but, you know, yeah, try to avoid the extravagant side of that if you can. And so definitely call your bank. Yeah, if you're yeah, using your if you're account. only using your debit card. Yeah, I don't know if any, if any debit cards do offer that. But no, it's not. That was mine does. Mine does. Yeah. Well, I'm with the credit union. Though, so. uh, but credit cards. Yeah. Back of purchase comes in half. That was good for that. Um, sometimes there are things like Apple Pay. It's less common than like Visa, but you could use Apple Pay and things like that places. I didn't see any Venmo or anything, so I think they have their own like. They have their own. They like, have their own app to like KK and things mm -hmm. like that. Uh, you can't even get them. I don't think unless you have a Japanese phone. So mm -hmm. yeah, credit cards work, and then cash. I just think cash is still gonna save you in any situation. Uh, if the if the credit card machine doesn't work, if your magnetic strip is bad, if the chip mm -hmm. is you know corroded or anything like that, cash is. So definitely still bring cash. Um, and taxes. And what's the what's the easier is it better to get it here or to get it there? Uh, I think the best way is to get it here now. Yeah. I saw they changed it at the airport. It's still pretty good. If you uh, if you're like, oh you know what, I just think I need a bit more and then change one there, but getting it at your bank you need to get like the best way to exchange. I know that my credit union doesn't do exchange. Mm -hmm. So if you're a credit union, you might want to check on that and see if anybody else. I know that um, SunTrust will do an exchange rate, like exchange your money for you. And like maybe Wells Fargo. Yeah, I get it to Wells Fargo. But, AAA does it. You yeah. can just go to AAA, you don't have to be a member. I think the guy told me uh, And you can change money there. I didn't go to change money. I went to my international driver's license. But you get a slightly worse rate than the bank, but it's still better. favorable. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's better. probably better than getting it at the airport. Yeah, I think the airport is probably what yeah. the the most. There's also, I noticed this time around, just money exchange rates are kind of all over the place. Even on like a small island like Nishima, there was a money exchange rate. Uh, but those it, I would expect that it's a really bad exchange rate. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah. This might not be the like, right. What is like, you know, and stuff like that, but the SIM cards, like I know when I traveled to Europe, we got a SIM card that worked for like two weeks while we were there, and I had to buy it like in the third airport and do that, but it lasted all over Europe for 50 days. But I saw one with online that the Japan, yeah, and it lasted 30 days. I mean, is that good yet, or yeah, I used something like that this time. My friend tried to use it uh, and then like didn't read all the instructions and messed it up, wasted money. For him, it didn't work because he called it wrong. And I believe it after he installed it, something messed up. But if you do it right and you get you read the instructions, you can save a lot of money that way. Because I know like AT&T and Verizon, it basically comes out to like $10 a day if you're doing your roaming, uh, which, you know, maybe it's not too bad, but it really adds up over a number of days. And I didn't want to do that for like a 15 day trip. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, $160. Yeah, no, like, that's well, not worth it. So well, and then your cards are kind of too long. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, I watched the video and they were talking about should I buy like a burner phone and or Google phone? Mm -hmm. uh, they recommended doing a, an app called Aerolo. What is that one? It's a eSIM card. They said it's great for going to Japan. You can basically, it's updating right now, but um, you can pay for like a two week SIM card. Yeah. Uh, like 20 bucks. Yeah, those are legit. I will say if you want to do a different SIM card, from my experience, you have to have your phone unlocked from your carrier, which means it's like fully paid off and not like locked into a contract, basically. So, mm -hmm. uh, that could like be an upfront cost before the trip. I, I wanted to do that this time, so I paid off my phone, <laughs> which was like a big upfront cost. And then uh, still like, you know, I was gonna have to pay a bunch eventually, so it didn't really seem like, you know, like a waste of money or anything. And then I got like, I think I just paid for one month because I was there for 
an awkward amount of time, uh, and it was maybe thirty dollars compared to one hundred fifty, a lot better. So there are a number of companies that do that. I think I've heard of. Uh, if you want like Chef Wi-Fi, there there are like little Wi-Fi boxes. I've heard that or something. I didn't know what was the name. I'll I'll put together a list and and send that information over. Well, now that it updated, they have. The biggest plan is the Motion, which, which has 20 gigabytes of data and covers Japan, and the price is going to be 30 days. Okay, that's pretty fair. I know I use uh, Mobile, M O B A L. Uh, and they have a pretty good uh, price for like a data only, and you have data and like service have an actual number, and they will give you text. It's uh, like $30 of data only. It would, have, it would have been like fifty dollars for like to have the able tech and stuff like that to make phone calls. Uh, you, there are places in the airport where you could get it. Uh, don't know if your phone has to be unlocked to do like a, a physical SIM uh, SIM swap. Mm -hmm. So uh, I can do more research on that one. Because uh, I just know there's a lot of companies. I would say if you see them, like they're more than like they are the shit.
works really well for getting around. I think it has really useful information for getting trains and stuff like that. The walking is pretty good. Um, the driving directions are good. The bus directions, it doesn't keep up with delays very well. So if you like miss the bus or uh, it's delayed, you probably won't know. But all in all, I trust Google Maps is very good. Uh, and then Google Translate works great. The video, like the camera function is great. Uh, it's really nice. So I, I recommend having those two apps downloaded. Uh, ready to go. Very helpful. Oh, uh, quickly, a note on the crowd. I think a lot of those really popular places will be very crowded, but there are still very nice places that just don't have the reputation. Uh, I think this is probably the most important, like Kyoto, for instance. Uh, we showed up to Kyo Mizudera, and the line was just out the door. We said, no, we're just not going to go there today. Uh, so we just skipped it. But walking down on the way there, we just randomly saw a huge set of stairs and said, that's nice, let's go there. And it was a temple that was basically, there was a few crowds, I think they were having like an actual service at the temple or something. But we walked around, we saw that they had like a free walk around tour. We paid like a few dollars and we were the only people there. Completely empty, the whole temple, all to ourselves, like two nice gardens and everything. So sometimes it pays to go off the beaten path for a little bit, look for something. You can see on the map, there'll still be a giant temple. Mm -hmm. uh, but if it shows like it's not particularly busy, I recommend those for uh, if you kind of want to stay away from all the crowds or if you think like, if you've seen a picture of it, it's good enough, and, and you just want to actually kind of experience the, a kind of more quiet, not so rushed uh, experience. That's what the tip I have for the crowd. Or going at like different hours. I know there's some temples and stuff that are open 24 7. Um, and the other thing is, you know, if you go really in the morning, really at night, probably people won't be there. So that's something to consider. Or uh, I want to tell Sid that he's not here. So, he's he's got to meet today. Right. Uh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so swords, you can get them, but the metal ones are really expensive. Uh, it is possible to get like wooden swords at like shops like in Jersey area that sell a lot of those. Those are honestly an option here. Uh, and I saw a lot that were just like, it, it was a wooden sword and it said, this sword does not open. So it was just like, a sheet, a solid wooden sheet, and make it look like it didn't look like a sword. It's um, a plastic sword. It wasn't even that. It was Not just, even a plastic wooden sword. Just a, a an empty sheet, oh. a fake sheet. Okay. Not even empty. Oh. Uh, but yeah, I know if you really want to know about that one. So I actually wanted to know about that too. Yeah. Does my husband think, really wants me to get him a sword? I think you can get <laughs> like a dull sword, and you would be able to get it. Uh, it's just a bit hard to carry around. Oh, I'm shipping it home. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's that's what I'm Get it for ship it immediately. Yeah, it's like I'm having it ship it home, yeah, ship it home yeah, automatically. Yeah. There's no carrying it around with me. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. How would you bring it back? Is it possible to bring it back on a plane? I think so. If it's not a sharpened sword, uh, then you just have to put it in your check baggage. It would have to fit in your suitcase. Like yeah, start checking. Yeah. yeah. Otherwise, they can pay a lot of money for just the story to go by itself and mm -hmm. you can make it. Uh, or you can ship it. <laughs> yeah, which is probably, depending on how heavy it is, might be expensive. Uh, but yeah, there, it's possible. When you say it's expensive, uh, what, uh, what is it? <laughs> depending on the weight, it could be like over $100 to ship it. Okay. But I guess it's now, crazy. tell me about the sword. Like, oh, uh, <laughs> I see. Saw them like on the high end, like five hundred dollars for one that looked really nice, like with the stand and everything. Uh -huh. And then the like the fake wooden one, like five dollars. And then the like fake metal ones that don't look very impressive, but it's still a sword. Uh, maybe somewhere like in the two hundred, yeah. Okay. And, and <laughs> It's true, right? If it's, if it's depending on the weight, how long it is, it's meant to everything. But 
Uh, she didn't give you fair wages. There's like shipping companies sometimes the hotels can arrange that for you. So it's an option. And okay. if you tell them, and you'll have a last So just wanted to touch on that. Uh, for those who are interested. Okay. At seven o'clock. Yeah. Kanji. So there you go. Is that okay? That's fine. Okay. Is everybody okay? Yeah. It's seven o'clock. All right. <laughs> okay. Yeah, and we should have it all recorded. Yes. Yes. So uh, going to Kanji a little bit. So Kanji are the, uh, the character system used for writing Japanese that is based off of Chinese characters. So these are the more complicated ones that you probably see. There are thousands of them. I was doing more research. I, I know that there are like the two to three thousand you need to graduate high school. Like that's what you should know about art schooling. But if you take into account like historical ones that are still uh, kept up with and ones used for very specific purposes, like you know, ancient medical, legal, stuff like that, there's tens of thousands. So uh, you can't know all of them and it's not worth trying to know all of them. I think most Japanese people probably won't know past, like very much past to like the 2000 kind of meeting um, for everyday life. I think that like maximum is 3000 if you want to get to like, you know, college level papers and stuff like that. So, uh, you know, that'll kind of sound intimidating, but some of them are pretty simple to pick up. So I've got some examples that you can look at. Uh, it kind of varies. Some of them, you can look at it, kind of understand the meaning, and then some of them are completely foreign. <laughs> um, Not at all. Like, for example, these are the numbers that you're using for. And, um, you know, one, two, three, pretty easy. It makes sense. One line, two lines, and two lines. Uh, but some of them don't make sense. They go to four, five, six. Seven, eight, nine, ten. Um, so I think the numbers are a good representation. So some of them are pretty simple, and then they get more complicated. It's like, why does this mean seven and that means eight? You know, I think you could like go into like really deep into learning why that's that that it comes from the original Chinese um, character for it, and then that comes from a long line of history of the Chinese But um, it's kind of like that. Some of them are easy to remember because of the way they look, uh, and the rest are complicated. Uh, let's see. I got these. These are some that are kind of easier to guess off of what they are. You guys want to guess what any of these are? This one? The third one? Yes, that's me. You know what it means? Yeah, it means person. And it's usually shown as like the way to remember it. It looks like it's a person with like two legs. It's just like two legs. Like this. Yeah. yeah, moon. Yeah, moon is on here. It's the one. This one, yeah. The sixth one is moon. And, and then, you know, you'll see the way to learn it. It's like it's kind of. It's got a curved edge and a straight edge. It looks like a like a half moon or a second moon or something like that. I will say this is the way to do kind of easy learning textbook, and this is the mnemonic uh, like pictures and stuff like that. You can see the first one means mountain because it looks kind of like mountain rays. Um, the second one means river because it's kind of like a, a flowing river and stuff like that. The third one is person. The fourth one is moon flight field because it looks like how they're segmented into their little squares. Uh, the fifth one is moon in Japan. So this one means sun. Okay. Uh, but yeah, it's sun. And the way that it, like, it usually, you'll see a diagram of this in textbook. And it kind of rounds out the edges and gives it little radiators. It's like it's fun. Just remember, basically. That's the, the way you learn Gandhi is to just remember. <laughs> um, uh, and then once you get like more advanced, these are kind of simple because they don't have any additional things, but the more complicated kanji will start incorporating these as elements 
link to it so that it becomes a little bit easier to read because the combining words kind of mean something more complex. Uh, the next one is study room. And then this one uh, means map. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, and these are just some of these are useful. Uh, this is combined. Uh, not There's another country that's exactly like this. Uh, that is not in the that is not in the Yeah, yeah. So, but this one needs to go out and out, so it needs to exit. This is probably a good one to know, just to remember um, that the same mouse with some of the, I think it's the end of the first one, and it's like the person mouse, so that people enter the um, entrance. Um, these are just some that I think would be useful to recognize, even if you can't read what it means in Japanese. So, like exit, entrance on the right here, that is, that's going to be better an onset. It will be separated by gender, and then the <coughs> lady kanji is here, woman, and then that kanji there is for men. You usually will also see like red and blue, so mm -hmm. you separate, color blind, and you have kanji. Um, <laughs> and it's usually like the way that textbook keeps this, and it's probably fascinating as well, is with, like I said, the mnemonic diagram and that picture. So, just get the one for lady, and it's like, oh, it's got like the leg like, crossed to something. Uh, like how a lady would sit. And then it just seems like that. Uh, this one, the one for man is like rice field, and then the bottom is character for power. So it's like, oh, the powerful man working in the rice field. That's how they you build your knowledge of power. Did um, you have a question, Jenny? Yeah, I did. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think I don't think Japanese has very specific words, like I know like Korean does have different words for like you depending on the hierarchy and age and gender and everything. I think uh, Japanese does in a sense have that like any you could call any older man on the street like big brother or uncle or something like that, but it is just the words that mean big brother or uncle. It might be similar kind of to, to other languages. Um, for the most part, I think a lot of people learn Japanese, they stick with like the very safe way. I'm always calling someone by their name, <laughs> which is their whole uh, name, first and last. Uh, probably just last. You know, <laughs> just last. Yeah. So like last, like just last name plus son. If if not, doesn't sound weird in conversation. It's it's polite. Um, so that always works. But yeah, there are uh, words like that that you could learn. I just think they probably don't come in handy as often as other languages. I don't know about that. Like if the family one kind of sits in my head, like if it's your like old like your mom, the older sister. Is everybody an uncle and an auntie? <laughs> yeah, you like you can just kind of roll with that. Even strangers. Yeah. Which I guess is like other like Asian countries have that. They're Filipinos, everybody is un uncle and auntie yeah. and, and sis older sister, wow. older brother. <laughs> okay, yeah. I think that still works generally. I just don't think it's used as often. Like I hear it more for strangers. Like you just, you know, I'll random things walk up like, hey uncle, like where is the what is station or something like that? Oh sorry, I thought it was just um oh yeah, this is a good one to realize. Sometimes you won't have the big thing or the English, but if the big aggressive usually in red, you do not enter. Uh even like stand person for video stop. So uh that's that's the time for it. I know I got mixed up one text because I saw it was vertically in black handwriting, so not the way I recognize it. And I almost went in, but I was like, wait, that means you're not there. Just another second. Uh, that's a good one to know. Uh, but it's usually obvious in the context when it has the no person. And these are just a few that I wanted to add that might be helpful. You might be like, in 
be sure of that strong. I pushed out the elevator, pushed and pulled the door, open and closed the elevator. Water, a lot of restaurants uh, might serve something that isn't water, like at the table, like a, a green tea or something. If you want water, look for that one. How do you say water? Water is Nisu. Nisu. Um, but yeah, we can kind of go in deeper depth in the front here. I just want to kind of give a, a, a broad overview of how they are. Alcohol is a big one to know. To know that when you're drinking doesn't have alcohol, you can't drink the can. Uh, it's a brand enough for the alcohol there. It's not a little bit of a hard to sell. Huh. Um, that's a good one to know. Big and small, that helps with like portion sizes, like at restaurants, you don't know. Luckily, a lot of restaurants have like the plastic thing in front to show you exactly what you can get. Um, oh, I think like because they have a lot of the like the automatic wash list and like the days and everything, and they're fancy as well, they usually have like the big flush and the small flush. So it's just nice well, they can have those lines. Um, yeah, so these are basically like school cons that you might see day to day, and we can go uh, more in depth on specifically. Have a say in the for the future lessons. Um, I would say for these contexts, it's really important because what you see in the DX is fine, you know, it it, but you might not see it, and then it kind of loses its meaning. So it's just really helpful to recognize. Uh, moving on uh, a little bit about New Year's. So, New Year's in Japan. And this is the world. <laughs> uh, it's called Oshogatsu. Sometimes it's Shogatsu, I don't know. But Oshogatsu is the Japanese New Year holiday. Uh, and there are a lot of different traditions that are practiced by, I would say, most Japanese people. Uh, I get the impression that this is celebrated, like probably the most celebrated holiday, because it's when people get time off of work. Uh, and they can kind of take it free without being like, oh, you know, you really putting a load on it to allow the rest of the team, everybody's on vacation. So uh, it feels like the most busy time of the year. And when you say, say Happy New Year is a long phrase. Happy Namaste, Omeyoko, Gozaimasu. Happy Namaste, Omeyoko, Gozaimasu. We're happy to uh, But there is a plan. You can just say, Ake Ome. Ake Ome. It's also Happy New Year. That's what the kids say. Uh, this is like what I would say. I'm seeing my manager for the first time in every year. Like, I feel like I'm going to over very much. But I feel like things like that. Happy New Year. The homes and businesses are decorated with what you see on the top there. Uh, there's bamboo, pine, mochi, nissan, which are sort of simply on top of the mochi. These all have their separate meaning for. You know what they're meant to inspire in the decoration and behind it. Uh, kind of time for that. I so actually I did a blog post on that on oh, New really? Year's. Yeah. So on New Year's yeah, very, like tradition. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's nice. It's easy. Like it's something that's too easy to go to. Like I, I know you just go and get it. Like basically a little bit of decoration. I'm like, oh, that might be nice, but it doesn't fit me that much. But uh, yeah, those are kind of the, the subtle New Year's decorations. Although they can be very big, it's like that's the, the basic idea of the decoration. So I've seen it like three full size bamboos, and they're like, you know, I think that would be tall, so like front doors and stuff. So that's what they've got going. And then for the food, uh, not the food, sorry, the first prime visit of the year is kind of a big deal. Uh, and it's usually you could go like wait until midnight, be at a shrine, go first thing in the morning. Uh, but also just the first time you end up at a shrine, you can still call it like your first shrine visit. Uh, and that's, I think that's maybe where here we might expect like people will gather somewhere to watch the ball drop uh, over there. Uh, it's more common for a lot of people to gather at a shrine for a festival on the year. Uh, you know, they have the food stalls and their main hot drinks because it's a very snowy soft water thing in Um Uh, and some fun traditions. I think I saw one on the news or on the in Japan 
where at the beginning of the year, in the clock strike midnight, they have just like a, a race from one temple to another or something like that, like down the street and around the corner. Uh, and the first three people are like the lucky man of the year. Mm -hmm. And people just absolutely go for it, sprinting. Like, imagine someone just sprinting down the hallway with like 100 people as hard as they can. Uh, and this poor guy, just leading the entire time, gets right in front of the finish line and just falls face first. And then he got like four plays. Oh, it wasn't like that. <laughs> but things like that. Shrines are fun because they'll have their like special traditions for the new year. Uh, and then talking about food, there is such a cookie soba, which just means like new year soba or end of year soba. So uh, it's not the case here, but it's really just like a bowl of noodles. Um, I think they're really long noodles, so they're supposed to represent like having a long life, and that they're really easy to like fight, and that's supposed to signify like easily leaving behind any like thing else from last year. So something like that. Like all the foods have a lot of meaning for the new year, um, but they think it's just kind of fit across cultures. Um, and we do even right at midnight, so it's like cross at midnight, but like in the middle. And then a fetchy, or a picture of here, and it's kind of like a box prepared meal that's eaten over the first three days of the year. Uh, and each dish has a different meaning, you know, like the theme for the fourth day or something like that. Uh, they all have the description, and there's a lot. This isn't even all the dishes, just like these little popular ones. So it's like a New Year's Venta. Yeah, I, know. <laughs> I, I don't really know what, how it's eaten over the course of three days when there's like a lobster in line. You probably go for that one first. Uh -huh. um, but I think it's meant to be like you have a lot of food prepared so that nobody's cooking for the New Year's. It's just like, hey, let's get a pizza and then make a fish and then kind of just easy stuff and not, not too much like laboring in the kitchen uh, until you get kind of well into the year a few days. Uh, and I think they're really, really expensive because they're <laughs> hard to prepare. And people probably buy them more often than they make them now. Uh, it's just so many little side dishes. Uh, probably not all they need to make. So uh, that's New Year's. And I had a more Western New Year's. We just went to like, the bar and <laughs> stayed there until uh, New Year and we left. Uh, but these are like the more traditional ways to do it because I have participated in it before. And that's all here. So we went a bit over time. Uh, this is from uh, Oranuki, where I used to live. Uh, this is like an island that's still part of the town. Uh, but this is the Seto Inland Sea. The Inland Sea, so it doesn't get a lot of big waves. It's usually calm, calm like that. Really nice. Even December, it wouldn't be cold. Uh, it was nice. It was I like that the overlook. Yeah. Where is that right here? That is uh, on the way to Hiroshima mm -hmm. from Tokyo. It's in Hiroshima Prefecture, but it's right at the edge of it, the eastern edge. Onomichi, a really nice town. Uh, it has a cycling route that starts in the main city, goes mm -hmm. around all these islands, over this bridge. Around the island, onto the next one, onto the next one, and then the next beach, like another big landmass. Uh, I, I recommend that if you have time, <laughs> but uh, you can like rent bikes and all you see everything more than a day trip. Well, it's kind of the same as Hiroshima, like it's really a day trip, but it's very easy to do. Mm -hmm. uh, the cycle itself, I think it's 70 kilometers, so you can do it at a day if it's not too much. <laughs> yeah. So, thank you. I don't know if you have any questions. Any questions? <laughs>